Good evening, everyone. I am Sat Jali, Professor of Communication at UMass. And and executive director of the Media Education Foundation, the organizer of this event. The specific genesis for the event tonight came from the firing of one of our panelists, Mark Lamont Hill, from CNN for his comments at the United Nations about the denial of human rights to the Palestinian people. I reached out to him um, to about coming here to discuss the case. And very quickly, events began to overtake us. First, an award uh, to Angela Davis by the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute was rescinded because of a support for the Palestinian people. And then, of course, as you've just seen, there was the firestorm of abuse and death threats rained upon Representative Ilhan Omar for daring to accurately describe the reality of AIPAC's influence on American politics, something that AIPAC itself proudly boasts about in its promotional materials. So I started to reach out to the other people on our distinguished panel. I had hopes, I did have hopes of one other person to join us, uh, the famed Palestinian legislator, Hanar Nishrawi, who after visiting the United States for decades, was suddenly unable to obtain a visa from the Trump administration. I hope you will ask why her important voice as an elected representative of the Palestinian people has been silenced from the discussion we will have tonight. Indeed, why was Omar Barghouti, the co-founder of the BDS movement, also denied a visa to speak in the US? Similarly, there have been attempts to silence the voices of our panel and this event. As one journalist described it in a headline, Israel supporters try to shut down UMass Forum about efforts by Israel supporters to shut down debate. <laughs> it, the irony is just, I uh, don't even have to comment on it. I have been told that scores of calls have come into the university administration protesting tonight's gathering. The State Republican Jewish Committee and the State Republican Party have called on the university to cancel the event. A letter to the chancellor signed by 80 right-wing pro-Israel organizations including the Zionist Organization of America, uh, the American Jewish Council, and the World Jewish Council, uh, protested the event and wanted the university to disassociate itself from it, demanding that the three departments who originally co-sponsored, the departments of communication, of women, gender, and sexuality studies, and the Resistance Studies Initiative, demanding that they withdraw their sponsorship. The university, specifically the chancellor, held firm to the principles of academic freedom uh, and said that departments had the right to sponsor events on the most important issues of the day. That, in the words of Chancellor Sabaswamy, quote, promoting the free exchange of ideas is one of the most important functions of the university. Further, as an act of solidarity against this intimidation by these reactionary outside groups, actually in some internal ones as well, and in defense of academic freedom and free speech, a number of other departments have subsequently joined the list of sponsors. The departments of anthropology, sociology, philosophy, health promotion and, po and policy, and STEPEC, the social thought and political economy program, have all come on board and I am very grateful for their support. I know that there was also very vigorous debate and discussion in a number of other departments about whether to support the event. In fact, I think it's safe to say that very few events in recent UMass history have garnered as much attention and argument as this one. <laughs> So the event actually has already served its prime, primary function, to stimulate talk, to stimulate talk about the way in which discussion of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is severely curtailed. Finally, I thought that wasn't enough, there was also a lawsuit filed by a lawyer who's affiliated with another right-wing organization, Americans for Peace and Tolerance a group of Islamophobic reactionaries. I love the names, right? <laughs> uh, to force the university to cancel this event. 
The injunction, of course, was thrown out, laughed out of court, actually, on Thursday. As everyone knew that it would be, even the people bringing it knew it would be thrown out of court. Yes, yes. That allowed this event to proceed. But if the injunction was not really about stopping this event, why did they spend the thousands of dollars on it? And the answer is pretty clear. It was not about this event. It was about the next one that may be planned by some other group. It was an act of intimidation and bullying about the future. I want to close by thanking everyone at UMass and throughout the Valley who's reached out to me and my colleagues of the Media Education Foundation over the past couple of weeks to express their support for this event. I also want to say a special thank you to members of Students for Justice in Palestine at UMass. for helping to promote this event under very difficult circumstances. I'm also very grateful to the members of Jewish Voice for Peace Western Mass. Espe especially, especially Rachel Weber of JBP, who went to court, actually went to court for us and helped defeat the motion to stop this event by making an impassioned argument about the dangers of watering down the dangers of actual anti-Semitism by conflating it with criticism of Israeli repression. So I also want to acknowledge the staff of the Fine Arts Center. They have been uh, fantastic, as has the entire team working behind the scenes to pull this event off. Finally, I want to thank the entire staff of the Media Education Foundation for all, the work on this, on the, all their work on this event, especially David Mello for his technical support, and especially Loretta Alper and Jeremy Earp, who have put countless hours into, making, into managing the details of this event. Our main work at the Media Education Foundation actually isn't putting on events, although you would never know it from tonight. <laughs> It's actually making movies. And a couple of years ago, we made a movie about the kinds of efforts we've seen over the past few weeks to silence pro-Palestinian voices and shape and distort how Americans understand the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's called The Occupation of the American Mind. And it lays out the different ways, and it lays out the different ways and different forces and interests that have worked to shut down debate, silence dissent, confuse the issues and conceal the reality of what Palestinian life is life living under Israeli military occupation. But even more importantly than that, our film shows that things are shifting as more and more people, especially young Palestinians and Jews who are joining in coalition with allies in the black liberation struggle to demand justice, are starting to see through these intimidation tactics and refusing to back down. What the resulting desperation, the phone calls, the letters, the lawsuits reveal to me is that the right are scared. They are petrified of these positive changes taking place in the culture. In that spirit of renewed hope, before we bring out our moderator and our panelists, I want to share a short clip from the conclusion of the occupation of the American mind narrated by Roger Waters that speaks to this historic moment. Over just the past few years, the proliferation of social media and internet news sources has made it increasingly difficult for the Israeli government and pro-Israel groups in the US to manage American perceptions of the conflict. Video footage and reporting from the ground bearing witness to the reality of the occupation are now more accessible than ever on the internet. In addition, over the past few years, a number of high-profile documentaries made by Israeli and Palestinian filmmakers alike 
have trained a harsh light on current Israeli policy and the repression of Palestinian rights. At the same time, a powerful new boycott, divestment and sanctions movement has been gaining momentum and raising awareness of the occupation. While activists from the Black Lives Matter movement have been making explicit connections between police violence against African Americans and the Israeli military's repression of Palestinians. We stand next to people who continue to courageously struggle and resist the occupation. People who continue to dream and fight for freedom. From Ferguson to Palestine, the struggle for freedom continues. And all of these developments seem to be having an effect. Polls now show that while sympathy for Israel remains at all-time highs among older Americans, it has been hemorrhaging among young people. Despite the efforts of the lobby, something really striking is taking place. Lots of young people are abandoning the mainstream media and turning instead to other independent sources. So they have a totally different way of making sense of what's happening, an unfiltered view of Israel's repression. And pro-Israel operatives like Frank Luntz are in a panic. In his latest report, he calls what's happening with young people a disaster and demands that Israel supporters respond. And people have answered the call. You have powerful right-wing billionaires like Sheldon Adelson, a major donor to Republican candidates, bankrolling a campaign to silence and intimidate student activists on college campuses. But it's not working. Groups like Students for Justice in Palestine, who see what's happening to Palestinians as a civil rights issue, have refused to be intimidated. They're refusing to back down, even though they're being labeled as anti-Semitic and terrorist sympathizers. And their numbers are growing. As the discourse begins to open, more people are starting to understand this as a rights-based issue, not an issue of radicalism. This is a movement for the rights of people whose rights are being denied, who are living under occupation, who want to live in their country freely, just like anybody else. You can see just so many video clips of kids having their hands smashed by soldiers with batons. You can see just so many pictures of thousands of people being killed as happened in Gaza. And at a certain point, you, there's a cognitive dissonance. You realize that what you're being told is a pack of lies. Let's just get away from the mythologies and talk about the realities, and then maybe be able to persuade people that they should not any longer give their unwavering support to a nation engaged in a policy that's not just inhumane and, and brutal, but ultimately suicidal. Given the central role that the United States plays in backing Israel, it seems to me Americans, all Americans, have a right to question particular Israeli policies, and in particular, the prolonged occupation. The fact that the Palestinian people have been kept without a state and without any political rights for decades now. For us in the United States, I think, the issue has to be, what is our government doing? How is our government allowing, enabling, supporting, arming, defending Israeli violations? In the end, this comes down to a battle for the minds of the American people, a battle over the stories they're told to make sense of this conflict, a battle over perception. The more Americans are able to see the reality of occupation with their own eyes, to see images of routine daily violence, of the repression and humiliation that never make their way into mainstream news, the more they'll question the image of Israel as this tiny little David up against the bullying Arab Goliath and start to wonder if it's actually the outgunned Palestinians who might be the real Davids here. When that starts becoming the dominant perception here in the US, all bets are off. It all comes down to American public perception. That's the one way to change anything, changing perception and understanding here, leading to a change of policy here. As long as the United States supports Israel, nothing's going to happen. The U.S. government will support it as long as the U.S. population tolerates it.